the best of the week on Relevant Radio. Welcome to The Inner Life. This is the show that's all about spiritual direction, where we hope to encourage and inspire you to living out your Catholic faith well today with the help of our expert spiritual directors. I am your host, Patrick Conley. Today on The Inner Life, we're exploring the Eucharist and the Scriptures. Making his debut as our very special guest spiritual director today is Bishop Andrew Cousins. Bishop Cousins is the Bishop of the Diocese of Crookston, Minnesota. And prior to that, he served as the Auxiliary Bishop for the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis. And he is now leading the three-year National Eucharistic Revival and is Chairman of the Board of the National Eucharistic Congress. Your Excellency, it is a privilege to have you on the show today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Patrick. It's a delight to be with you. Well, specifically about the Congress, I know the U.S. bishops recently met in Baltimore. Do you have any updates about the Eucharistic Congress you'd like to share? We do. You know, we're going full steam ahead, so we really hope everybody goes to our website at eucharisticcongress.org and signs up. We mentioned at the bishops' meeting that, you know, one of the the concerns we've had is um, sometimes, for example, families might find it hard to be there for all five days, or some people might find that the five days too much to take off work. So we have now begun to sell day passes, and we've been able to discount those day passes. And we've also, because of really generous sponsors, like Relevant Radio is a generous sponsor of the National Eucharistic Congress, we've been able to now make it so that children under 12 are free. So even if you registered already and you you were planning on bringing children under 12, you'll get a refund for those children. So, you know, a couple that has five children under 12 and wants to come for the weekend can come for basically $250. And if they sleep in a campground or we're going to actually open up churches and schools as places for families and youth groups to stay if they want to, we're trying to make this uh, a come one, come all experience. And it's going to be really a, a gathering of the whole church. So I hope that people will go to the website and sign up to come. Yeah, absolutely. And we are, we are a privileged and proud to be uh, a generous sponsor of the Eucharistic Congress, and we are grateful that we'll be there broadcasting live there at the Congress. We've been encouraging people all along to uh, show up for Jesus. We're showing up for Jesus together, and we have travel packages put together, too, at relevantradio.com slash encounter. Let's just go into some of the institution narratives. Specifically, I'm, I'm thinking, well, I have Luke in front of me here. So he took mm-hmm. bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Some of the words, I mean, it seems like those words are so rich in so many ways. And one of the things that continues to strike me, even when I hear the celebrant at Mass saying these words, and that Jesus is working through him in persona Christi Capitis, that he is giving himself for us. That's the thing, for you. It's given for you. What does that mean? How, how do we engage with that and bring that to a deeper level of understanding in our lives? I, I, there's two comments I would have about that. One is that those words of St. Luke there, so Luke and Paul have very similar traditions with regard to the Eucharist, and you know, Mark and Matthews are, are quite similar. But uh, especially in Luke's gospel, whenever the Eucharist is mentioned, those four words are mentioned. He -hmm. took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. So that happens in the multiplication of the loaves. That happens at the Last Supper. It happens at Emmaus, right? And so clearly for St. Luke, who's writing as a member of the early Christian community, this is the earliest Eucharistic prayer, right? This taking bread, saying the blessing, broke it, and gave it to him. And it's still, of course, in our Eucharistic prayer today. Right? right, And it's the same thing that St. Paul says when he teaches the Corinthians about the Eucharist. He uses those same four verbs. Those four verbs actually become a way for us to understand what's supposed to happen in us, right? Mm. Which is, I allow my life to be taken by the Lord, and then I allow my own life to be broken and given for him, blessed, broken, mm. and given. And this is actually part of what happens in the disciple. It's part of what he learns from the Eucharist is that my life belongs to the Lord and my life is blessed by him and I'm filled with his grace, but I, my life is also broken in the sense of I experience the cross, I experience my own weakness, and then my life is meant to be given for him. And so as I live a Eucharistic life, those kind of four passages become part of what it means to live a, a Eucharistic life. Mm-hmm. But th- the other aspect that's very clear is for you. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. This is my, given for you. Um, and it's meant to be very personal, right? It's not for all. Um, it is for all. It's not just for a group. It's for individuals, right, within the group. 
And so it's like even when St. Paul, when he, when he speaks about Jesus' death, he says, Christ who, who died for me and gave himself for me, right? And so each of us are meant to experience that at the Eucharist, that he's given for me. And that tells me about something about who I am. It tells me that I'm God's beloved because he, he gives himself for me. And, of course, the Eucharist is a foreshadowing of the wedding feast, right? He's the bridegroom giving himself for his bride. And I'm loved in such a way that he's willing to give everything for me. It tells me about my worth and my dignity. Cardinal Ratzinger, when he was commenting on this passage in a homily before he was Pope, he said, he said, we should remember it cost Jesus everything to give us the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And we should remember that whenever we hold it, right? Or whenever we receive it, that it cost Jesus everything to give us this gift. And this is how much he loves us. And so it's meant to speak to us of a very intimate relationship of love. And it reveals, therefore, my identity. Who am I? I'm the one that, that God found worth giving himself for. Yeah. Of course, the other aspect of the identity is very clear in the writings of St. Paul, which is, I also become his body, right? And so it's this teaching that's in the scriptures and in the fathers of the church that we become what we receive. And so it's revealed that I am one with Jesus now after receiving Holy Communion, and therefore I'm meant to be his body. And so how does Jesus live in the world? How does Jesus offer his sacrifice in the world today? How does Jesus um, spread the truth and bring healing, all those things? Well, through his body, the church, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is meant to happen concretely in each of us as members. So the Eucharist, in a very real way, reveals our identity, who we are, and then it reveals how we're supposed to live based on that. But it makes a lot of sense to me that, of course, Jesus' physical body suffered on the cross, but... We should not then be surprised when his mystical body suffers as well, when it's given, you know, when his body continues to be, as St. Paul says, right? I make up for what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. It seems to me that this is another invitation into a meaningful suffering, a suffering that actually now carries with it a redemptive quality that on its own would be left as merely meaningless. Absolutely. And this is one of the great values of the Eucharist is that it has the power to give meaning to our sufferings. Hmm. And it's one of the great struggles of the modern world because human life is filled with suffering. It just is because we're limited right. and we're fallen. And there's no escaping that. We have our limits and we have fallen nature and so there's going to be suffering in this world. But the suffering doesn't have to be empty. It can actually be powerful. It can actually be part of the gift that I'm able to give to God and to give to others. And it's part of as St. John Paul II will say, it's part of drawing down God's grace upon the world. In fact, he says it's the mode par excellence to draw down God's grace upon the world. And that's what St. Paul is saying hmm. when he writes that from prison. And he says, I make up in my own sufferings what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Well, what is lacking? The sufferings of his mystical body have not right. yet been united to him. Hmm. And that's what we have the opportunity to do in the Eucharist. I often speak about that phrase. My mother used to say it when I was a kid, and I didn't really like it when she would say it. She would say, <laughs> offer it up. <laughs> yeah, right. Yep. And you know, I didn't like it because it kind of ended the conversation. You know, I couldn't complain anymore. <laughs> but what did she mean? Well, mm -hmm. she meant, think of someone else who is suffering more than you right now. Imagine that person in your mind. And then... Take this suffering that you're experiencing in your imagination and connect it to the person who is suffering through Jesus. Now, of course, that would be ridiculous if it wasn't for the Eucharist. Like, how could my, you know, suffering being picked on when I'm in junior high possibly affect someone else who's going through greater suffering? Maybe people who are in prison or people who are thinking of suicide or people who are living in war-torn areas. What difference could it possibly make? Well, if that suffering can be brought to the altar and offered there, united to Jesus' suffering, and if it becomes part of his great offering to the Father, well, then my little suffering is transformed into something powerful that can actually apply to people in war-torn areas or people who might be considering suicide or someone wow. in prison. 
and it can make a difference for them through being united to Jesus' one true offering. And that's what St. Paul's doing, right? When he's saying, I found my suffering isn't meaningless. It has meaning here, and I'm, I'm uniting it to Jesus is for his church. And it's making it different for his church. And how important that is for, for people who have cancer, or for people who are going through difficult marriages, or people who are going through difficult moments in their life of darkness, of tragedy, of mental illness, to know that these sufferings are not worthless they can be placed on the altar, at the offertory, and they become part of Jesus' offering to the Father. And then they have infinite value for the salvation of the world. Like what you just heard? Share it with your family and friends. And thanks for listening.